Hello everyone, uh, thanks for joining. Welcome to the Memestetica online program. Uh, my name is Valentina Tanni. I am uh, the curator of this series of online conversations. Um, Memestetica is a program produced by Axioma Institute for Contemporary Art in Ljubljana. And this program is also part of uh, uh, the 11th edition of a, a longer series uh, of events called Tactics and Practice. Um, throughout the Memestetica series of talks, we are discussing the world of memes, uh, viral content, and more in general, participatory culture online, with a particular focus on aesthetics, also in relation with uh, the history of uh, contemporary visual art, of modern and contemporary visual art. Uh, so, uh, in connection with the topics of my book, which is also titled Memestetica and just released in Slovenian by Axioma, we wanted to discuss these uh, topics with some guests, uh, artists and researchers, uh, and we are going so to discuss the role of memetics uh, um, in contemporary society, uh, especially from an artistic point of view. So, considering memes um, as a proper language, uh, a tool for self-expression and possibly also a new art form? We'll see. So today I have the pleasure to host uh, uh, Joshua Citarella. Thanks, Joshua, for being with us. Hi, thanks for having me. Hi, uh, we're very happy to, to have you. I have a few questions for you that I'd like to, to ask. But uh, before we, uh, we begin, I'm going to say, um, I'm going to introduce you to our uh, audience and say a few words about your work. Uh, Joshua Citarella is an artist. Uh, he is uh, researching online political subcultures. And uh, in 2018, he published a very successful uh, essay titled Politigram and the Post Left. And uh, he also currently hosts uh, uh, Memes as Politics. Uh, on Montez Press Radio in New York City. Um, uh, he, he is also an adjunct professor at the Rhode Island School of Design uh, and the School of Visual Arts. Uh, and he um, has served as an outside advisor also at Carnegie Mellon University and Tufts University. So welcome again, Joshua. The first question that I am curious about, the first question I would like to ask you is, um, actually about the uh, uh, the origins of your research on internet memes. Uh, this is uh, a sort of ritual question of the Memestetica series uh, because I'm uh, always very curious about this kind of thing, so how uh, this kind of research uh, uh, started. So can you tell us a little bit when and why um, you started working um, on memetic images, on memetic languages, uh, as an artist, uh, as a contemporary artist. Uh, for example, when I uh, first came across your work and your name, uh, you were also uh, um, part of a, a collaborative artistic project uh, online called Jogging. And that project was probably one of the very first artistic attempts to uh, confront and engage uh, with the aesthetics of viral images online and, and memes. So also opening up another very important discussion about uh, the status of images, of art images specifically in the context of the web. So how do uh, uh, artists are supposed to react to this new uh, visual situation and this new world of participatory culture and the circulation of images uh, uh, online. Uh, so um, can you maybe uh, tell us a little bit about uh, the, uh, the star, how you did, did, did your research on memes started, uh, something about the jogging, but in general, your first approach to the world of internet memes? Sure, sure. Yeah, I think um, in in terms of the art world, um, seeing the emergent aesthetic behavior on social media platforms such as Tumblr, um, watching the um, the the absolute um, explosion of the Overton window around twenty 
uh, 15 and, and specifically in 2016, um, there was not yet a field or a specific discipline that had a, a codified way of studying or understanding this mimetic phenomena. And it just so turned out that coincidentally, by participating in collaborative post-internet projects like jogging, um, I was well prepared to understand some of these things in a way that apparently in in hindsight, I think uh, journalists and academics were not sufficiently primed for. Um, so uh, when I first published uh, Politogram in the Post Left, which is the original PDF uh, and, and a, an artist book, a printed publication in 2018, I expected it to be one of a dozen other studies on this type of content. Um, and then those studies just never came out. Uh, so yeah. um, I, it's, it's kind of, uh, it's a little bit maddening at, at some uh, points because uh, some of these things just see uh, self-evident to me, but I suppose I am really taking for granted some formative experiences around 2012 of having the experience of making an image, watching it go viral, not being attached to my name, and then circulate throughout the internet, take on new meaning, meaning be paired with images and text and all sorts of um, mimetic interpretations and what have you. Um, yeah, so I would I would broadly describe um, my experience and research as being something that was almost like an internet hobby. It was just a curiosity that I happened to be familiar with these spaces, happened to be watching it, and then seemingly the stakes in those communities grew more and more serious over time, uh, and that was indicative of some larger um, structural issues. I mean, the uh, maybe the most easy example of this is uh, talking about what the internet was going to do to culture um, beyond just the visual aesthetic level, but at the economic level, at the political level, and watching Bitcoin go from a penny to $1,000 in 2013 was a pretty strong indication at the time. So I, I feel like a lot of the work now, <clears throat> excuse me, I feel like a lot of the work now is um, going back and contextualizing what uh, what those original ideas were in a few reading groups focused on the intersection of art and technology, specifically in New York City, with um, a, a, essentially a core group of members that moves between these ideas, spanning a period of maybe now 10 years. Um, and it just seems that those original insights just continue to become more and more compelling and more meaningful over time. Um, yeah, I think if I can throw in our, our utopian hope <laughs> at the beginning, maybe to place that in contrast with how things have seemingly turned out, is that um, there's a great um, there's there's a great potential in uh, connectivity, and um, I think very early on people were really hopeful about what that might lead to. Uh, quickly, those aspirations soured in the face of what social media became. But there was this, this glimmer, there's this narrow window of possibility, which was that you could embed um, a radical, subversive, um, um, meaningful content Trojan horsed within a viral image that would then radically spread uh, it had its own self-propagating mechanism in it. Maybe this was humor, maybe, maybe it was shock, maybe it was outrage. And um, the the desire for a lot of those projects was to use, to, to instigate a moment of laughter that would spur you into self-reflection, that would make you reanalyze your uh, the, pre the um, presuppositions you had brought to the image, make you question something and have this um, moment of reflection and reconsideration that you often get uh, through encountering an artwork, but instead we were trying to do that through the screen, through social media, through memes. Um, really, I mean, at the time they were these kind of improvised sculptures. They weren't properly memes, but they circulated yeah. as viral images and they were, I think, a, a rough uh, attempt to produce memes as, as a compromise between physical artworks and a, and a viral image. Um, but seemingly those strategies were picked up by people who have diametrically opposed political political beliefs. And um, th and then that kind of brings us to the internet that we're at now, where you have all of these um, wonderful utopian and then uh, terrifying cyberpunk realities bundled into the same thing. And maybe that's the work that we're doing here is trying to tease apart the, the good from the bad. And um, yeah, we can decide if it's a 50-50 or maybe an 80-20 or a 
a 95.5 potentially, but um, I think there are still yeah, important the, things that need to be salvaged. Is, is, uh, yeah, I think the percentage is fluctuating a bit. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. It's not is always, it going up or if, down yeah, now? Yeah, it's going up or down, like Bitcoin. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I about <laughs> this, I, I recently about this, I recently came across um, uh, a video, an old video interview um, with uh, William Gibson on YouTube, and he was uh, saying, like in beginning of the '90s, I think, and uh, commenting on his books, uh, uh, he was saying a very interesting thing, maybe similar to what you were saying now uh, about the concept of ambivalence. Uh, he said, we need to uh, stay, uh, to keep an ambivalent uh, um, uh, attitude toward technology because uh, it's mm. impossible to ignore uh, one or, or the other uh, consequences. Uh, and so we, uh, uh, to, in order to better understand our future, we must remain profoundly ambivalent. And I, find, I, I think that this is uh, really relevant today, as you said, because we are living in, in, in an environment online that gives us everyday proofs of both these feelings of being of a, a great potential coming, but at the same time, great dangers and, 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 and things to, to, I mean, that, that frighten us a little bit. So yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I, I agree with this. And as you said, uh, we are now we are trying to discuss uh, uh, visual aesthetics of memes and viral content, but of course we are all uh, very aware of the fact that uh, memes are more than that. Uh, it, it's not about just about their aesthetics, but uh, uh, it's uh, uh, their power, uh, uh, especially in the context of politics, as has, uh, has been proven to be really uh, really strong and really relevant and and in fact in, in more recent years uh, as you said your research focused speci specifically on this so specifically on the study of uh, online subcultures trying to investigate this uh, content that very young people are creating online and engaging with online and how the, you are trying to to study how this content influences their political views right am, am, am i correct mm -hmm. yeah and and yeah. and so uh, can you tell us something about uh, uh, the aesthetics that uh, these uh, gen z memes uh, seems to have um, maybe uh, which are their influences from from an aesthetical point of view, uh, and and maybe if you saw some changes during over the past I don't know five years in this in, in, from, from a visual aesthetic and and from the the, the point of view of language more generally. Hmm. Yeah, it's um, it's it's very interesting because uh, one might imagine that in previous generations the idea of counterculture or subculture was specifically attached to a type of visual identity where someone would be a punk or they would be a mod and they would look different uh and and that's how you would tell what their political beliefs and their cultural interests and yada yada um but it's interesting now because there are all of these warring political factions uh specifically the group of um the teenagers mostly that I look at are, they've grown up a little now. So I want to say that the median age is 17 or 18 years old. Um, back in 2016, it was, it was quite a bit younger, but I've watched them now move through these spaces. I've watched them become politicized in the process. Um, what is often described as a spectrum between irony and sincerity. Uh, what can begin as funny uh, comedic engagement with memes um, can very often metastasize into some really uh, uh, horrific and, and um, unfortunate politics. Um, but it can also have a very beneficial effect in that you can use social media to politically educate people and um, bring them to clarified, more coherent uh, and, and constructive progressive ideas over time. Um, but the, the great oddity now is that, and maybe this just has to do with the the, the head and the long tail of media, more or less, is that all of the different subcultures, as diverse as their political views are, as much as they all hate each other, they all look exactly the same <laughs> in that they use the same uh, vernacular or vocabulary of like meme characters, such as the, the Wojaks and the, the gamer chads yeah. and, and whatever. Um, I am actually, uh, coincidentally, now I'm going through 
Um, I'm going to produce the second edition of Politogram in the Post Left for, I, I hope September I'll have it ready by. It's always been a constant back burner type of a project, but I've been looking at the portrait of that period in 20, say 17, 18, um, really focusing at the core of it. And a lot of the memes in terms of the characters um, and, and who makes a cameo in the, uh, the, the stage play of, um, uh, of these, these meme stories, um, the characters have swapped in and out significantly, but the formats are still pretty much essentially the same in that you would have something like, say, for example, um, the Galaxy Brain format, which gets increasingly complex yeah. as it moves through the successive tiers. Um, that was paralleled by a format called Increasingly Verbose, which would do a very similar thing, um, an increasingly uh, uh, lengthy description as the image was either compressed or drawn more poorly through the successive tiers. And then now, just very recently, you have something which is, um, I actually forget the name of it, but it's uh, four different bodybuilders replying to each other in a comment thread, which does exactly the same thing. So I, I think that if we can <laughs> maybe swap out or, or ignore the aesthetic variables for a moment, um, the, the communicative patterns and the formats are still essentially the same, but you would probably be able to tell like, oh, this has like a 2018 era, this has a 2020 era, uh, just based on who, who, is, um, who is the star of that season's program or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Th th this, is, this is very interesting, the fact that you can't really separate the different political uh, currents from 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 a particular aesthetic, but it, that is probably really new if if we look back at history. The fact that you can't really yeah. separate visually, I have I have to think about uh, about this, but I don't think that we had this in the past with this situation. Well, it could where, be a positive. Yeah, yeah. It could be it a could positive be development in that people strip away the countercultural aspect, the political, uh, the, the visual element, and then they just get into the policy stuff, and maybe that would be successful at shifting the Overton window away from privatization. And I mean, especially here in the States, it's it's quite a bit more severe. Um, but potentially, there there is a, a generative potential in this that I, I don't want to lose sight of. But yes, it is very weird when the, the right wing and the left wing are visually indistinguishable from each other. Um, yeah, I just don't want to, I don't want to, um, <laughs> I don't want people to incorrectly interpret this in that their political ideas have collapsed and are now the same. It's really, it's just the stuff oh, that they post. It's just yeah. the images. The ideas yeah, are, are maybe, could not be more different. Yeah. Maybe it's just a shared language. So they have to use, uh, um, par, I mean, bits of languages so, in order to understand what's going on, to make people understand what's going on. So maybe it's just using the same code uh, to, to communicate. Um, th there is another question, another uh, switching subject for, for a minute. Uh, another question that I would like to ask you um, on a very different subject. Uh, um, I would like to talk a little bit about the relationship of these uh, cultural uh, world uh, with, uh, with the art world as we know it, with more traditional mm -hmm. art world. Um, so how did you uh, see uh, the art world reacting to this new visual ecosystem, to this new situation that is taking shape online. Uh, because I know that uh, you, you have, of course, a deep knowledge of online culture because of this research uh, that you are doing uh, for many years, but you also have been working with curators, museums and galleries. So I think you should have a comprehensive view also of, uh, uh, of that infrastructure. So maybe you can uh, see both sides. And I'm curious because I, am, I have been a curator too. I have been working in the art world too. So I am uh, uh, also trying to make sense of this new, uh, uh, new cultural situation that it's totally different from, from the old one, from many points of views. So uh, what I was wondering is, is if, uh, should we uh, consider the traditional art world as, a, as an infrastructure, uh, I mean, obsolete and just uh, look forward and move to, uh, toward totally different systems, also in terms of uh, organi organization and economical models? Uh, uh, or maybe should we try and hope for uh, a reforming of existing structure? How, how how are you seeing the, the art world reacting to this new situation? Because I see, what I see, it's mainly 
um, a defensive uh, um, take on this. They are trying maybe to defend themselves and to um, build uh, walls and to, 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 to establish differences between who's a professional, who's an amateur, who is uh, allowed to be inside and who is, uh, uh, who should mm. remain an outsider. So I would like to hear your thoughts about this. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, these are all of the, all of the most interesting, uh, questions. Um, I think, uh, I think in reference to the art world versus being um, a, a platform artist, let's say, let's say if, if the context in which your work is viewed is more likely Instagram or Facebook or Tumblr or wherever you happen to be uh, versus a museum, a gallery, an institution of some sort. Um, hmm. There is a, I think, a temptation that a lot of the platforms believed on the early side is that they were getting rid of nepotistic gatekeepers. That was a, that was a very coherent pitch, a very coherent narrative through the early era of social media. And I think some of this was, <clears throat> excuse me, I think some of this was buoyed by the naive and optimistic hopes of projects that coincided around that time, specifically the Arab Spring and Occupy Wall Street. And there was this idea that you would not need to structure formal participation or have um, concrete hierarchical social structures, and you could create this form, this new form of mass democracy through just sheerly connecting people through social media. And then this would lead to literally in the case of the Arab Spring, toppling dictators um, in the, I think, hopes of Occupy Wall Street by ousting the, the corrupt uh, um, a 1% that was also incestuously embedded with the state and, and causing financial catastrophe. Um, but, but unfortunately, the media narrative and the common consensus of what social media is doing to society has had a complete 180. Um, in, in that now you can't hear a story about social media without disinformation and radicalization or fake news and psychographic profiling and, and, and everything else. And so there's a parallel to that, um, that, uh, that, that the art world has had to, um, kind of I incorporate those narratives into its own internal, uh, uh, conflicts because, you know, we don't want a type of, uh, exclusion that is. Um, nepotistic and neglects the role of cultural institutions and and whatever uh but you know not all like some gatekeeping is good like expertise is good curation is good those are things that should not be necessarily um democratically decided like an exhibition that is curated by mass democracy uh would probably look much more like your news feed right so there is actually there are a few people who specialize in a certain area and they should curate um, exhibitions that have the appropriate historical context and pass expertise down through from one generation to the next. And all of that is really important. Um, and that doesn't really seem to be happening on the platforms. <laughs> so uh, yeah. take that as kind of level, level one. The, the second is that um, there is some kind of antagonism between these two things. And I mean, I, I literally embody some of these contradictions or th these conflicts right now in that I am partially funded through crowdfunding, which is entirely new. There's not really artists who have done this before, um, but I also work with institutions and I firmly believe in institutions. Um, one of the, <laughs> I mean, this is essentially like a, it is a infra elite uh, conflict that is playing out through the arts where you have the, the old money of the aristocracy, and then you have the new money of the Silicon Valley class, and um, they're fighting back and forth with, the, with each other. And then, you know, we may have to decide at some point whether you want robust cultural institutions that have some other responsibility to the public, or if you just want financialized NFT people dystopia. Um, and yeah. I think that art is bad, and I don't want that to be like the arc that moves forward in history like, I think there are other things that need to be preserved and maybe these things should not be subject to financialization. Like that, that evacuates the important uh, humanistic values and all the things that we would hope that good art does. Um, 
I'm, I'm really going off now. Yeah. <laughs> it's a bit of a sore spot. Uh, yeah, but so the, yeah, I, I, yeah, the other I, problem I, I, that you're... I feel you, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, <laughs> I could really, I could, yeah. I could go on this one for forever, but I think that, yeah, institutions <laughs> versus platforms is the frame that it has yeah. to be approached through. Yeah. Yeah. The, the problem is that, uh, uh, I mean, not all the institutions, there are some institutions that are trying to, uh, I mean, explore these new worlds and, and find new ways to, to deal with uh, a cultural system that it's different from before. But most, uh, I mean, the majority of art institutions are uh, um, just really scared and, and not really trying to get into this thing unless they see big money and, that, and then we circle back to the people situation. I mean, some mm -hmm. institutions yeah. uh, uh, just tend to follow the hype. So it was, I mean, sometimes it's the blockchain and other, another time can be artificial intelligence. They just, the problem is that sometimes institution, when they try to look at the new, they follow the hype. And that's maybe a problem that we are, we, we are dealing, I see, I see happening right now, because when they want to the new, uh, they sometimes get the, the, the perspective, just trying to, um, to follow the most recent trend that, that, that it's happening. And most of the time, unfortunately, this trend is connected with uh, money, with, uh, with big sum, with big sums of money. So, yeah, it, it, I understand it, it is a very difficult, uh, uh, I, I know that, that that was a very difficult question, but I, but it's something that I try to, I'm trying to reflect on myself because it's, uh, yeah, it's also personal. I mean, <laughs> for me and i think for that's you the too. most interesting question i think yeah thank you very much joshua for being with us it's been a uh, really a pleasure to 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 chat with you today and uh hope to get the chance to meet you maybe in person soon and uh, thank for all the people joining us today online and uh, bye see you next time Thanks. Thank you.